And so, um, so we're going to continue in our sermon series on God's love. And, and before uh, we uh, go any further, I just want to do just a quick review. Because if you, just, if you miss one sermon, one aspect of God's love, then you're going to give an, an incomplete picture of what God's love looks like. So I encourage you, if you've missed any of the sermons, uh, to go to our website, bristolmissionary.org, and, um, and check out our sermons. I put all the sermon videos on there. And so if you missed one of these sermons, I encourage you to, to, to watch the ones you've missed because it will give you the, the full picture of what God's love looks like. And so we're going we're gonna to just do a little quick review. And so first, we learned that uh, God's love is relational, that um, love necessitates relationship you love someone, you automatically want to be in relationship with them. And so if God is love, that means he wants to be in relationship with you because that's what love does. And we talked about how God created us in his image. And so he has a vested interest in every one of us, regardless of who we are. And it says that he created us in his image and that, we talked about how that gives us value and dignity and worth. It means that God determines our value. We don't determine our value. We don't determine the value of anybody else. We are made in his image, and he has a vested interest in each of us, and he wants to know us. So secondly, um, two weeks ago, it was that God's love is freedom giving, meaning that he doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't make us love him back, because that's what love does. You know, a man doesn't propose to his wife with a gun to her head and say, you have to marry me. He gives her the choice to say no. And many, many people say no to God. And we talked about how when you say no to God, it takes you out of his perfect will and plan for your life. And, there's, and there is a, a tremendous downside to that. And, so, and that you can negatively affect your life. And even more egregious, you can negatively affect the lives of those who suffer because of your choices. And we talked about how people become victims of people's bad choices. And so that's going to fit a little bit into our sermon today. And then last week was that God's love is protective. Not necessarily that he will protect us physically, because we all know that millions of people have been martyred for the faith, even some of most of Jesus', Jesus disciples. But he gives us his Holy Spirit to indwell within us, to protect our hearts and minds when we go through times of trial. And so that brings us to today, and that God's love is justice. And of all the different aspects of God's love, this is the one that probably people misunderstand the most because through God's justice we see his wrath and so we can look in the Old Testament and we see God being wrathful and he's smiting people and he's telling Joshua to go into the Canaanite uh, land of Canaan and wipe out the Canaanites and, and we can't wrap our minds around this right and we say well how could a God of love be so mean how could he be you know how could he how could he be giving commands to wipe people out and people can't understand this in the early centuries of the church, there was this guy named Marcion. He was an early church father. And uh, he, um, he couldn't, couldn't understand this either. He couldn't understand how God could be wrathful and, and God could be love at the same time. And so he came up with this idea that there must be two gods. You know, there's this angry, wrathful God that no one likes. And then there's this loving, benevolent God that everybody likes. And so he decided to teach that. And he subsequently got uh, kicked out of the church as being a heretic. But I understand, it makes, under, it makes perfect sense how we would struggle with understanding how God can be love and also be wrathful at the same time. And what we're going to learn today is that God's wrath flows out of his love because his love is justice. And if you're not a good student of the word, and if you lack knowledge of the word of God, you can, you can believe all kinds of things about God that are simply not true if you lack the knowledge a few years ago, uh, there was a book that came out by this atheist philosopher named Richard Dawkins. Perhaps you've heard of him. And the name of the book was called um, The God Delusion. And basically, he's, he's, he's saying that anybody who believes in a God, any God, is delusional. That was basically what he was trying to promote. But this is what he says about the God of the Old Testament. He says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. That's a lot of words. 
Clearly, he was, he was trying, to, trying to get us to think that the God of the Old Testament is this big moral monster, this bully that is uh, only out to kill people. That's what he believes. And the reason he believes this is because he lacks knowledge. And a lot of Christians don't know how to answer that. You know, how, how can God be loving and be also wrathful in the Old Testament when he's, when he's commanding people to kill him? How can that be? Well, I promise you by the end of this sermon, you're not only going to know the answer to that, but you're going to know how to answer with confidence and with conviction. And so, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah is one of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And uh, we're going to look at, the, we're going to read verses 1 through 17, and we're going to take a look at the picture of what God's justice looks like. And let me tell you, God's justice looks nothing like human justice. And so this is how it starts. It starts with Jeremiah complaining to, to, to God. Is he complaining that God is mean and, and unjust? No, he's complaining that God is standing by idly and not doing anything about the wickedness in the land. And so this is, this is how Jeremiah complains to God. He says, you are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to a butcher. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will, you, will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. So Jeremiah is complaining to God that all this wickedness is happening in the land and God's standing by idly and not doing anything about it. Have you ever felt that way before with our country? All this wickedness is happening and we wonder where God is? I know people felt that way on 9-11 when the towers came down. People, stood, people accused God of not caring. You know, if God is love, he would, he would step in and do something, right? When we hear about a, a little child who God forbid has been abducted and murdered. We, we raise our hand to God and say, where are you? Okay, that, that's what Jeremiah is, is doing with God. He's saying, where, where are you? I see all this wickedness and you're not doing anything about it. Now, we need to give a little frame of reference here exactly what is going on. If you, if you look at uh, the whole entire you know, Old Testament, it, it gives great detail exactly what that wickedness looks like. And so uh, in Jeremiah chapter 32, it says this. Uh, he's talking about the Israelites. It says, They built high places for Baal in the valley of ben Hinnon to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech, though I never commanded it, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. And so the Israelites had fallen into Baal worship. Baal was the... Um, the Canaanite god of fertility, and they believed that he was responsible for rain. And so if a drought came and there was no rain, they would do these grotesque sacrifices where they would throw their, their firstborn into the fires of Molech and sacrifice them. And it's that level of evil that Jeremiah is crying out about. In Ezekiel chapter uh, 22 to 23, it gives a li detailed list, almost like a bullet point list of all the sins that Israel had fallen into. And it says that they oppressed the fatherless, the widow and the foreigner. They were, they were murderers. Uh, they committed lewd sexual acts, incest, adultery, accepting bribes, extortion, exploiting poor people, witchcraft. And of course, the child sacrifice that was related to the idol worship. And that is what Jeremiah is crying out for. And who wouldn't? Who wouldn't cry out to God and say, God, where are you when all this wickedness is happening before my very eyes? You know, we have a hard time wrapping our minds around child sacrifice and Baal worship because that's so far removed from who we are today. And so I want to give a, an example of, of kind of a, a modern day similar uh, experience uh, that this world went through and it just so happened 75 years ago this week, 75 years ago on Monday was the, the liberation of Auschwitz. Now that's something that we can understand and wrap our minds around because we see the videos and we see the piles of dead bodies and, the, and the, the gas chambers and the crematoriums. And we know that over 6 million people were murdered simply because of their ethnicity. 
And we cry out and we say, where is the justice? Every ounce of us demands justice. And the reality is that most of the perpetrators, many of them, most of them, got away with it. They escaped to other countries or they were given leniency. And justice wasn't done. And we cry out and we say, God, where, where are you? On a local level, three years ago, uh, two young girls, Abigail Williams and Liberty German, uh, were walking down a trail in Delphi, Indiana, and they never came back. And the next day, they found their, bo- their bodies. Uh, this man, who um, one of the girls was able to capture on her phone, they believe murdered these girls. And he has yet to be found, and we cry out, God, where's the justice? And that's what Jeremiah is crying out to God for with all this wickedness. And this is what God says in response. He says, if you've raced with men and foot and and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble and save country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? What what God is doing here, he's using poetic language to say, Jeremiah, you can't understand my ways. If If you can barely keep up with men, how can you understand my ways? As it says in Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My way of justice looks different than human justice. That's what he's saying here in a very poetic way. He says, many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. It will be made a wasteland, parched and desolate before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares now, he's, he's referring to his punishment that's coming for this wickedness. He's saying, basically, he's saying in a very poetic way, he's saying, I'm going to send in an invading army, the Assyrians, as we f- will find out, the Assyrian army, to desolate my field, my vineyards, which is, the in, uh, which is Israel. And he calls uh, them the, him his shepherds, meaning they're going to do his bidding. He says, I'm going to make my prized possession, this this Israel, I'm going to make it a wasteland as punishment for the wickedness that they have fallen into. He says, over all the barren heights and the desert, destroyers will swarm, for the, the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to another. No one will be safe. They will sow wheat but reap thorns. They will wear themselves out but gain nothing. They will bear the shame of their harvest because of the Lord's fierce anger. This is what the Lord says, as for all my wicked neighbors who seized the inheritance I gave my people Israel, I will uproot them from their lands and I will uproot the people of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them back to their own inheritance in their own country. And if they learn well the ways of my people and swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be established among my people. But if any nation does not listen, I will completely uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. And so if we had no context to go by and we just randomly opened up the Bible to Jeremiah and he's talking about, you know, eliminating people with the sword of the Lord, we could think, you know, what's up with God? He's mean. But if those words, those stern words are in response to the wickedness of what was going on in the land. And so, through this passage, we're going to learn some really important things. And the first one is that God's justice de- defends the defenseless. Jeremiah, he says this in verse 4, he says, Because those who live in the land are wicked, the animals and birds have perished. Even the animals and the birds have perished because the people are so wicked And it breaks the heart of God when those who are most vulnerable are taken advantage, even animals and birds. It says this in in Deuteronomy. In in Deuteronomy, God gave uh, the law of Moses. And um, part of the law of Moses was uh, was these, um, these laws that were meant to look out for the vulnerable and the marginalized. It says this in it says this in verse 19 through 21. It says, When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. 
When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So that's God's welfare system. Basically, he's saying, you know, whatever's left when you're harvesting, make sure that you leave enough for, for, the, for the poor to go out and get food. And so, um, so God, is, God is concerned for those who are weak and can easily be taken advantage of. In Psalm 68, David says this, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He, he leads out the prisoners with singing, but the re- rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. So God is a God who defends the, the widow, and he is incensed when those who are marginalized, when those who are, who are easily taken advantage of are exploited. This, this past week, um, one of my wife's good friends named Kelly Rassler, her, her 34-year-old husband, suddenly died of a heart attack. It was, it was tragic. And uh, so we went to the, the viewing on Thursday, and literally there was a 1,000 people who came through. They go to a really large church, and it was so beautiful to see the church respond in such a powerful way to just wrap you know, their arms around her and their four little children and they had this donation box for people to put money in to try to you know, help her because he was the only source of income. She was a stay-at-home mom. And as I saw that, that donation box, I thought, you know, how despicable it would be if someone were to try to sneak in and steal it with all that money. You know? That's, that is what exploiting the fatherless and the widow and the foreigner is like when we try to take advantage of, a, of the situation to our own advantage. And it says that God, that incensed God, and that's what was happening in Jeremiah's day. So God is a defender of the defenseless. Secondly, he, God's justice punishes the offender. It punishes the offender. And this is, this is where God's sense of justice is completely different from our idea of justice, as you'll see. Jeremiah 12 says, Over all the barren heights in the desert, stories will swarm, for the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to the other. No one will be safe. And now he's making reference to the Assyrians. The Assyrians who God gave permission to go into Israel and decimate the land. And we, uh, we read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17. And this happened in 732 B.C. when the Syrian army, the Syrian Uh, king went in and God used him as the sword of the Lord to punish the wickedness that was happening in the land. Now, I said this this is where God's justice justice is different than ours. Because our justice would be the moment there's an infraction, the moment there's an offense, that we're going to come down on that moment, arrest him and put him in jail. God's justice looks a little bit different. This is what God's justice looks like, and you see this pattern all throughout the prophetic books of the Old Testament. First, God brings a charge uh, detailing their sins. So we read that in Jeremiah chapters 2 and four, two to 4. Then he describes the punishment that's going to happen if there's no change, and we read about that in Jeremiah uh, chapters 4 through 6. Then God waits for repentance with the promise to relent, saying, if you repent of your ways, I won't, I won't punish you. We read about that in Jeremiah chapter 7. And after a period of waiting, if there's no repentance, then God will uh, exact his punishment decisively, severely, and proportionately. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we see that he does that. But here's the thing. From the, the moment that God starts warning Israel in Jeremiah to the, to the, to the time where he actually allows the Syrian army to go in and sack Israel. It was about a 140-year time span. 140 years, God sat back, waiting for them to repent, to no avail. And finally, after 140 years of wickedness and of warning them time and time again, he finally brought the hammer down. And that's what we can't understand. Why would he wait 140 years if they were sacrificing children and doing all this wickedness, why would, they, why would he wait that long? So we could actually make the case that, that God is not just enough. You know, some people, they look at God's wrath and say, well, he's just horrible. We could actually make the, the case that God is, 
not qu quick enough with his justice. In the early chapters of Genesis, when God is promising Abraham the land of Canaan, he says this unusual thing. He says, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan, but not until the sins of the Canaanites have been fully measured, which was 400 years. So, so God made Abraham, the, the descendants of Abraham, wait 400 years for the sins of the Amorites and the Canaanites uh, to fill up before he finally gave them the land. And that's when he told Joshua to go into the land and eliminate the Canaanites. For 400 years, God allowed that to happen. Why does he wait? That's the question. Why, why does God wait so long to punish people? And that's what Jeremiah was asking God. Where, you know, why, where's your justice? Here's why. Ezekiel 33 says this, I take, this is God speaking, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? It breaks the heart of God to punish people who are created in his image. It doesn't matter the level of wickedness that they've done. He sees in them value, regardless of what they've done. He says, I don't, want, I don't take pleasure in doing this. I don't take pleasure in, in the death of the wicked. And so I'm waiting for them to turn. Numbers 14 says this, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So God's justice defends the defenseless. God's justice punishes the offender, but not quite in our time frame and thirdly, God's justice restores the punished. And in verse 15, it says, But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them back to their own inheritance and their own country. And this is what you see repeatedly over and over and over again in every prophetic book. When God warns them about their sin, tells them what's going to happen if they don't repent, waits for them to repent and they don't, punishes, punishes them, he always follows it up with a promise to restore them. Isn't that, sound, isn't that amazing? God's desire is not to punish people. That's the last thing he wants. He wants people to be in relationship with him. He desires a relationship with us because we're made in his image. And it grieves him when that relationship is broken. His greatest desire is for that broken relationship to be restored. And so he waits and waits for repentance and gives chance after chance. But when that repentance doesn't come, his righteousness and his holiness demands justice. But once justice is delivered, God seeks out the one who's punished to restore them completely. In Galatians 6.1, it says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. The heart of God is to restore people regardless of the wickedness that they may have found, them, found themselves in. And what a message to you and I. I. So many people think, there's no way I could go to church because the church would fall in on me. I've heard people say that. There's no way I could pray to God. He'd strike me with lightning. You know, there's no way God wants to know me. There's no way God can forgive me. And people have this small view of God when it's the last thing that God wants is to have a broken relationship with his, with his creation. He wants to know you. And it doesn't matter what you may have done in the past or what you may have done this morning. As long as you repent and say, God, I'm sorry. Give me another do-over. He will say, yes, yes. I want to restore you. I want to show you this side-by-side this -side, um, uh, comparison in Jeremiah. At the beginning of Jeremiah, God calls Israel a prostitute. He says, you, you have defiled the land with your prostitution and, and wickedness. You, you have the brazen look of a prostitute. You refuse to blush with shame. But at the end of Jeremiah, when he promises that he will restore him, he says this, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. I don't know of any prostitute who can go back to being a virgin. But with, but with God, all things are possible. And that's the promise that God is saying, I will, I will rebuild you so that your name will be Virgin Israel, capital V, because the past is in the past. And once you've served 
your sentence. I'm going to restore you to where you were before, O oh, virgin Israel. Isn't that beautiful? So many people, if that's you, you think, well, God can't forgive me. Our God will remember all the things I've done. No, that's not at all the case. When he forgives, he forgets. And his greatest desire is to know you and to restore you to the where you were before as he, restore, as he restored Israel. Isn't that beautiful? That's God's justice. God's not just so interested in, in striking people with lightning. He actually wants to restore them. Whether they're the Israel or whether they were the Canaanites, God wants to restore. Fourthly, so what's this look like to you and I? How does God's justice look for you and I? God's justice will be revealed on Judgment Day. That's the promise of Scripture, all throughout Scripture. And we can take hope in that. Because when we look at this world and the wickedness of this world and the, and the, the profanities of this world and, the, and all that happens, and we, we, we can legitimately ask, you know, God, where are you? Maybe some of you have been the victims, you know, yourselves. You've been abused. You've always questioned, you know, where's God in all this? Why did he allow me to go through this? I want to read 2 Peter, verses 3 through 9. Peter was responding to people who were asking that very thing. You know, the early church lived in a very wicked time where they were being persecuted and killed for their faith. And Peter says this, Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By that same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So Peter's responding to the very complaints of the people his day. That was similar to Jeremiah's complaint. When, when is this God who loves us, when, when is he going to exact justice on this wickedness that we're experiencing. And Peter says, that day's coming. But remember, a day's like a thousand years with God. And the reason he's delaying his justice because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants to give everyone the opportunity to repent. And so he waits and he waits. And in the meantime, people are victimized. And we don't understand that. But that's the heart of God he loves his creation so much he doesn't want to be broken off from them, so much so that he will wait and wait and wait, waiting for people to repent and come to, back to him. So much so that he, he, he waits while people are being victimized. But the promise of Scripture is that someday all this is going to come to an end. And the trumpet will sound and Christ will return. And there will be a day when we all stand before God, the wicked and the righteous, and God will deliver, deliver judgment on the wicked. And that will be the day that they will be condemned and judged. And that's the hope that we have. And so we have, we have to have an internal perspective to help us understand that the heart of God is to love his creation so much so that he's willing to wait as long as he possibly can for people to come to repentance. That's the love of God. And the one thing we can take comfort in is that when God does exact his judgment, it will be only done with justice. As it says in Jeremiah 30, 11, I will discipline you, but only with justice, meaning that his judgments are fair. And for the wicked who have done so much harm, the justice that will be done to them will probably be a severity that we can't 
even begin to fathom. But you and I, we stand under the blood of Christ if you've accepted Jesus. And we know that his judgment will be based upon the righteousness of Christ and not on our righteousness. It will be based upon the goodness of Christ and not on our goodness. It will be based upon the blood of Christ and not on our goodness. Amen. Why don't you pray with me? God, I thank you that love is not just warm and fuzzy feelings, but it's also justice displayed in the face of wickedness and evil. Lord, in a world where such evil and wickedness exists, all we can say, all we can say is, come, Lord, quickly. Come with your mighty angels to take your church home and deliver your judgments on those who profane your holy name and have killed, abused, and destroyed your beloved creation. God, we thank you that as believers in Jesus Christ, we stand covered by the blood, made righteous, not in a righteousness of our own, but by the righteousness you have credited to us through him that protects us from that coming wrath. God, we love you. We love you. Amen. We'll see you next week.